All right, good morning, good afternoon, uh, whenever you're taking this in, United States History. This will be our last session of notes for this week, so whether you're watching this on Thursday or Friday, depending on what class you're in, I uh, hope you have a good weekend. There will be four or five slides, there will be a couple videos, and there will be a homework assignment that goes with it. So, when we talk about soldier's life, the first thing that you got to lock into is the fact that there were approximately three million soldiers who fought in the Civil War. Uh, now, uh, not all of them saw combat, whatever the case might be. But the other thing you got to remember is, is there was 22 million people in the north and there was 9 million people in the south. Um, so that's 10% of the population of the United States fought in the Civil War, um, which is kind of crazy to think about. We're going to watch a short video on how armies are organized. So when we talk about battalions and things like that, when we talk about the upcoming battles after this, we'll have an idea of uh, When you signed up to be a Civil War soldier, typically in your town or in a, in a city near your town, you're going to go ahead and join a company. That company of maybe in concept 100 men, but more close to 30 to 50 men in a lot of cases, will eventually be commissioned into a regiment of 10 companies typically. Those 10 companies make up a regiment, and we're standing in a regimental monument here. The numbers of men in a regiment changed a lot throughout the war, but you know, in the middle of the war, you could assume a regiment has about 300 men from the same town or county or state or part of a state. A regiment is typically commanded by a lieutenant colonel or a colonel. And those regiments are usually put together into things called brigades. The brigade is, in my opinion, the standard fighting unit of the Civil War. Battles, in my opinion, are fought by brigades. If you want to understand a battle, understand what the brigades did, and it'll all fall into place. Um, brigades are typically commanded by, appropriately, a brigadier general. Brigadier, brigade. Uh, a brigadier general will command a brigade. Sometimes, if that's not available, a colonel will. Sometimes even a lieutenant colonel, especially as it got later into the war. A brigade will consist of two, three, four, five, six, even seven regiments sometimes. But if you typically have four or five regiments in a brigade, and those regiments each have three or four hundred guys, you're looking at about 1,500 to 2,000 men in a Civil War brigade. Brigades are grouped into divisions. Typically, Confederates put more brigades into their divisions. Yankees tended to put fewer. So you're often going to have two or three brigades into a Union division, but you'll typically have three, four, or five um, brigades in a Confederate division. Therefore, Confederate divisions are a lot bigger. Um, divisions are ideally commanded by major generals, those major generals overseeing the brigadier generals and brigades below them. Um, but both sides varied greatly on this. On the Union side, you're going to regularly have brigadier generals and in a few cases even colonels commanding divisions. On the Confederate side, that's much more rare. Uh, in the East and the West, you're usually going to have major generals commanding divisions. And not only major generals, major generals that went to a military school, the Virginia Military Institute, uh, West Point when they were back in the North, um, or of course the Citadel. Um, so you're going to have a different treatment when it comes to these divisions. Either way, a couple of divisions, two, three, or even four divisions, makes up a corps. Both armies did it that way. A corps is ideally commanded in the South by a lieutenant general, and it usually was indeed, sometimes by major generals. And um, uh, on the Union side, a corps is usually commanded by a major general, though sometimes brigadier generals did it as well. Um, these corps will then be grouped, one, two, or three, or sometimes even four, or five, or six, or seven, into an army. So in summary, both armies, both the infantry and the cavalry, are organized into companies, into regiments, into brigades, into divisions, into corps, and into armies. Memorize that and you'll understand the Civil War just a little bit better. The artillery is organized differently from the infantry and the cavalry. The artillery is, of course, cannon-based, and one cannon is called a piece. And if you put two cannons together, you get a section, okay? That section is typically commanded by a lieutenant, um, and if you put a couple of sections together, two or three, you actually have a battery. A battery in the south is four cannons on average, and in the north, it's about six cannons on average, although both sides change in that respect. And that battery on both sides is ideally commanded by a captain, but often commanded by a lieutenant as well. A battery might have had about 120 to 150 soldiers in it. These batteries could be attached uh, throughout the army, throughout the war, in different ways. Um, 
But either way, as the war went on, both sides came up with a system where they could group batteries together. The South eventually would group batteries by battalions, and the Yankees would group batteries by brigades. Not a whole lot of difference between them. The Confederate battalions tended to be bigger than the Union brigades. What's more important is how they were attached, and ultimately both sides realized that early in the war, when they had individual batteries and battalions attached to specific infantry units, it wasn't working because you could be in a tight spot and not have all the artillery you needed. So both sides developed a huge artillery reserve where they would have a certain number of battalions and brigades of artillery that the army commander, that the chief of artillery could command and get into the right part of the battle at the right time. Okay, so now we'll talk about uh, the Union soldier. The average Union soldier was almost 26 years old. He was white. He was native born. He was a Protestant. Uh, and there you see the pay. So if you signed up, and remember you had to sign up for three years. So if you signed up for uh, service, you were commissioned as a private unless you were... Um, like a college professor or a mayor or something like that, then you were given a commission as an officer. But typically, if you signed up, just enrolled or were drafted, uh, you got $13 a month. And you take that times 36. So as a grand total, when you're all said and done and you've served three years uh, and putting your life on the line, uh, you walk out of the Army with 400 and sixty-eight dollars. Uh, if you're a con if you're a Union soldier, uh, not a lot of money, but it was more money than some people were making at the time. So some people signed up for the army just to uh, be able to provide a better living for their family. The other thing that they had an issue with though is being able to pay on time. Uh, again, do you go from having money in your coffers to pay for things, but all of a sudden? Um, you know, if there's if there's five hundred thousand soldiers, and you take that thirteen times five hundred thousand, uh, now you're now you're talking, you know, two point five million, and you don't have that money available uh, right away. So it's one of those deals where you have to make sure, uh, and it took a little bit of time to raise enough money to actually fight this war. And you can see in the bottom there, if you were an African American private, you were paid seven dollars a month. Uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation and a couple of things in 1864, with about a year left in the war, that pay became equal. Uh, now I'll watch a video and take a look at some of the equipment that Civil War soldiers had and used. <laughs> Standing in the, the museum library here at the West Point Museum with a rather stoic uh, figure. He is uh, a representation of a typical Union infantryman of the war, and he has the basic accoutrements that everybody wore. The Civil War soldier, North or South alike, of course, had his basic uniform, whatever was issued. In this case, this fellow is wearing the standard U U.S. Uh, Army issue fatigue blouse or sack coat and forage cap trousers. North and South alike, the soldiers carried the same basic uh, accoutrements. The basic thing that the soldier had to have with him, of course, was utensils he needed to fight. The primary thing is his cartridge box, which holds 40 cartridges, either on a sling like this or on the waist belt itself. A lot of times Confederates would uh, wear it on the waist belt instead. His waist belt, which has his cap box, which he needs to uh, prime the weapon. Of course, a bayonet scabbard to hold the bayonet for the gun. He has a canteen and haversack kept on the left side out of the way of the cartridge box because you want to be able to get to the cartridge box. The haversack would hold some rations, maybe some extra ammunition if he wanted to. And then for his own personal well-being, he has a knapsack on the back. The knapsack, both north and south, if they were used, could have extra clothing personal items such as a diary, maybe photographs. You see uh, Confederate soldiers with knapsacks during the war, although the typical configuration is for them to have a blanket roll. Uh, to take the blanket, make it into a long tube, and then put a 
wrap it around your, your body. North and south, they did that alike because, the, as you can see, the knapsack is really not a very comfortable thing to, to carry. But in battle, of course, the, one of the first things you did was to drop your knapsack. Sometimes you never got it back because you never came back there. The Confederacy did import English accoutrements, the Enfield accoutrements. The standard Enfield accoutrements were, had the same general idea, except that they, they were shaped differently. And the fastener that came with the, the English belt was an S hook in the shape of a snake. But otherwise, the Confederacy basically just you know, kept on manufacturing their versions of what the, the uh, northern armies had been using before the Civil War. So this is fairly typical of what would have been issued. The, the whole setup was developed primarily just before the Civil War, and then it lasted up until the 1870s as the main way a soldier was accoutred. The weapon gear, the cartridge box, waist belt, such, came from the Ordnance Department. And then, of course, the, they decided that the canteen and haversacks were done by the quartermaster department. So these departments had to inter, intermix and make sure that the soldiers got what they needed. Basically, it was just when you when you were enrolled as a soldier, you got handed your, your gear. That was what you were supposed to use. Uh, now we'll take a look at the Confederate soldier. The average age of a Confederate soldier is, at this time, unknown. Uh, the reason why that became a little bit harder to track is because by the end of the war, the Confederate didn't have as much, um, as many people, so it got to be a point where there was a whole bunch of young boys, uh, and when I say young boys, anywhere from 11 and up, to old men, and when I say old men, you know, guys over the age of 50, which at that time uh, was fairly old. Um, so, by the end of the war, the South was taking anybody that could hold a gun, basically, to help them fight. Uh, again, a lot of similarities. They were white, they were native-born, they were Protestants. Uh, typically, uh, Southern soldiers were farmers, where Northern soldiers were worked in uh, a factory of some sort typically and you see right there confederate private was eleven dollars a month uh, which brings a grand total of a three-year commitment up to 396 so uh, less than what a union soldier was making but as you see right there uh, most times the confederate soldiers weren't paid the confederate even though the union had to raise a whole bunch of money and and they might have been a little bit behind uh, after about a year or so they got it normalized and they were able to pay on a on an almost regular basis you know that they, they were they were fairly uh, adequate the south with the inflation and the blockade and not being able to trade and having to print money and the money that they're printing isn't very uh, reliable and shortage of supplies and the list of the South's hurdles that they had to overcome goes on and on and on. Uh, one of the things is typically soldiers didn't get paid. Uh, so that was a sore spot for a lot of them. Um, now, you, you've seen it already. We've talked about some battles and there's a battle in uh, July and then the next battle's in uh end of August and then there's a battle in September and then there's not much fighting over the course of the winter and so even though you were a soldier and you fought in these battles there was usually some time between battles now some battles would last you know you had, so you had like the seven days battle in the, in the peninsula and then you fought day after day after day uh, but after the seven days battle and after the peninsula campaign uh, which ended in July the next uh, fight was in the end of August and that was the second battle of Bull Run uh, you know, so there's, there's a lot of lag time in between. Some of it is because you had to walk everywhere you went or ride a train or ride a boat or whatever. Uh, so th that took a little while to get to where you were going. Uh, the other part is, you you know, after you fight a big battle and whether you win or lose, you have a whole bunch of things that you have to clean up. Uh, so it's one of those deals where if, if you have a regiment or whatever that's been killed, uh, kind of like the, the Zouaves that we talked about earlier in the week, um, you have to replace them and, and you have to get replacement soldiers and all those things. So, um, uh, time in camp was spent a lot of different ways, writing letters, um, back home, you had checkers, you had card games, jacks, dominoes, things that are still around today. 
Uh, you spend a lot of time whittling, and smoking, drinking, making music. Uh, we'll watch a short video about what soldiers did while in camp. The popular image of the Civil War soldier is that of a young man wearing blue or gray, standing shoulder to shoulder with his comrades and marching into a great battle. However, only a small portion of the soldier's life was spent in combat. Between the battles and marches were vast stretches of inactivity that were marked by three things, duty, drill, and diversion. The day begins at dawn with the bugler blowing reveille. At this, all the men rise from their tents and fall in for roll call. At this point, men are assigned to the various fatigue duties, manual labor that keeps the army running. This can include cooking, cleaning, building roads. In the cases of artillery or cavalry, this includes the care and grooming of horses. Another form of duty vital to the army's existence was guard duty. Detachments of troops were stationed not only throughout the entire camp of the army, but also at the far reaches of that camp, often only a rifle shot away from the enemy. Those troops not assigned to duty would stay in camp for drill. Drill is an essential part of the soldier's life. This is how he learns to handle his weapon, how to march in formation, and how to execute the various battlefield maneuvers that will be used in combat. Drill can be broken down into three various forms. Drill by the squad, in which a non-commissioned officer leads six or eight men in practicing of maneuvers or the manual of arms. Drill by the company, in which a company commander or a captain leads up to a hundred men in battlefield maneuvers. And then finally, drill by the battalion, in which all ten companies of a regiment are formed on the parade ground and execute the vast sweeping maneuvers that come to mind when we think of Civil War battles. When not drilling or performing some other vital task for the army, men had precious few forms of diversion with which to occupy their time. The most popular by far was reading and writing. Men were desperate for news from home or the outside world, and they got it from whatever source they could, whether it was an often read newspaper or a cherished letter from a loved one. Men could also be found playing cards or chess or also involved in some of the various social clubs that were formed throughout the army, whether it was Bible study groups, glee clubs, or drama troops that were performed on special occasions. Whether he wore blue or gray, these are the activities that filled the soldier's life between the great battles that decided the fate of our nation. And the last slide for the week, we'll talk about um, food. So Union Confederate soldiers ate pretty much the same kind of food. There was one thing in particular that is uh, fairly common. It's called hardtack. Hardtack is a biscuit that's made of flour and water um, and a little bit of salt if you had it. And basically, you take flour, you put some water in, you make a paste, you cook it over the stove, and you eat it. Um... The best way I can describe it to you, because I've, I've, I have eaten some over the course of my life in, in another uh, class I was in in college. Somebody actually made some and brought some in. Imagine a saltine cracker with no salt and much harder. Uh, kind of like, it's kind of like peanut, it, it has a hardness of like peanut brittle, but tastes like a saltine cracker uh, with no salt. Uh, so you can imagine, not the greatest uh not the greatest food uh, you'll ever have. Uh, the other thing is because they were constantly on the move, uh, they'd, they'd come across salt, pork, or, or beef. Uh, basically, you, you make, um, you cut some meat off and you, you put it in a whole bunch of salt, dries it out. Uh, jerky ish is probably the best way to describe it. You have cornmeal, um, you have grits and things like that. Coffee was a big one. Uh, you know, there's there's a variety of different ways to make the coffee, but uh, coffee was always a big one. Uh, the other thing is, as you're walking through an area, if there's berries, if there's corn, if there's whatever, uh, typically they just take it and eat it. Um, whatever could be scavenged, you know, if there was um, game that was available to be caught, 
the one thing about that is is you don't want a whole bunch of people out shooting rabbits and deer and stuff like that as they walk through uh, to give away your position. But if there's any game that could be caught, uh, vegetables, if somebody is walking through a field and farmer had cows, they would just requisition the cows, slaughter them, and then give the cow, give the farmer some money. Um, the one thing that happened a lot of times is by the end of the war, uh, especially when the fighting was mainly in the South and the South didn't have a lot of things to be able to provide for their soldiers. They didn't have money. Uh, one of the things they didn't have was food. So sometimes uh, the South would end up losing a battle or, or um, surrendering a, a piece of ground just for the simple fact is they didn't have the energy to hold it any longer. Um, so we have a short video on uh, what type of rations or what type of food uh People ate, and that will be it for the week. There will be uh, homework in Schoology. Uh, other than that, have a good weekend. Uh, women's volleyball, good luck for the games this over the weekend if you play. I think you play Friday night, but not 100% sure. So. veteran John D. Billings wrote his classic history of soldier life, Hardtack and Coffee. He devoted an entire chapter, 34 pages to be exact, to army rations, how they were issued, and how they were cooked. His primary aim was to dispel the false impressions that had come about regarding what soldiers ate. Now, one of the most widely known pieces of Civil War food was Hardtack. Hardtack was a soldier's bread ration, and it had been around since the Crusades. The version of hardtack issued to Civil War soldiers was invented in 1801 by a man named Josiah Bent. Bent called his concoction a water cracker, and for good reason. The recipe, if you could call it that, had two ingredients, flour and water, which were then mixed into a paste and baked. The result was a dry cracker that would stay more or less edible for an extended period of time. And I do mean extended. In fact, some Civil War soldiers received issues of hardtack that had been left over from the Mexican War more than 10 years earlier. The longevity of a single piece of hardtack depended greatly on how it was made and how it was stored. Improperly packaged or underbaked biscuits could become infested with maggots or weevil larvae, prompting many soldiers to call them maggot castles. And even when properly cared for, the crackers were incredibly tough, leading many soldiers to call them flower tiles, toothbreakers, and other names. The solution to both problems was one and the same. Break up the cracker and boil it. Soldiers would break up the hardtack with the butts of their muskets and boil it in hot water or coffee, which would then cause the maggots and weevil larvae to float to the surface, allowing soldiers to skim them off the top and continue drinking their cup of joe. Boiling hardtack and coffee also gave the hardtack itself at least some degree of flavor. These, of course, were not the only food items issued to the Civil War soldier. Each day, a soldier in one of the U.S. armies was entitled to one pound of meat and one pound of bread. Now, occasionally, fresh beef was the meat ration, but more often than not, they got pork. And this pork was salted for preservation, and it was known then as salt pork or sometimes salt horse, which gives you an idea of how it tasted. For bread, hardtack was generally the rule, but when armies were encamped in winter quarters or in the same place for a long period of time, they might have access to soft bread. An example of this is when Joe Hooker took command of the Army of the Potomac in the spring of 1863 and ordered that ovens be built outside of the Army's camps so that soft, fresh bread could be issued to his soldiers. Now, bread and meat were issued to soldiers individually. Other items, however, were issued in larger quantities of 10 or 15 pounds, which would then be split up among 100 soldiers or so. Items in this category included beans, peas, rice, sugar, and of course, coffee. As you can probably guess, this was the ration under the best of circumstances, and soldiers didn't always get all they were entitled to. For instance, beans and rice were not issued to soldiers on the march, and fresh bread was usually one of the first luxuries to go. It's also worth pointing out that even Civil War soldiers knew that even the most fulsome ration was lacking in key vitamins and nutrients, so much so that it was not uncommon for officers to use their own money to supplement their troops' diet. An example of this is Captain Henry Abbott of the 20th Massachusetts, who will have his family in Boston send onions and lemons to his troops in Virginia to help supplement their diet. Now, mostly what we've talked about so far pertains primarily to the Union Army. Robert E. Lee's men at Appomattox were considerably less well-fed than their counterparts in the Army of the Potomac. However, this was not the case at the start of the war. The Confederate government adopted the U.S. Army standards for feeding its troops, with many men boasting that they got fed better in the Army than they did at home. Unfortunately for Johnny Reb, this didn't last very long. 
The Confederacy did not have the same manufacturing capability as the North, and southern ports were blockaded by the U.S. Navy. Even worse, the Confederacy's railway system was simply inadequate for moving the vast quantity of food required to feed the armies. On the eve of the Battle of Chancellorsville, Lee recorded that his soldiers' daily ration consisted of 18 ounces of flour, 4 ounces of bacon, and the occasional issue of rice, sugar, or molasses. It's no wonder, then, that one of Lee's primary objectives in the Gettysburg campaign was to secure food and supplies for his literally starving army. Now, whether he ate the standard government issue or something appropriated from a local farm, the Civil War soldier was expert at making delicious dishes out of whatever they could get. Veterans' accounts are chock full of suggestions of things you could make, telling us that the Civil War culinary experience is only limited by our imagination. All right, that is all the stuff that we have for this week. Hope you have a good weekend, and uh, I'll see you via video next week. All right, bye.